first out today, we have Per Jansson, vice riksbankschef at Riksbanken. And he will explain their role uh, in the financial transformation and um, he will explain what he sees coming ahead. The stage is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, for inviting me to this forum. It's a great pleasure to be here and be able to talk to you. Uh, I should also say that I have a colleague of mine with me, Carl Andreas Clausen from the Riksbank. He's one of our experts in this field. So in the case you have very complicated questions, I will gladly invite him into the discussion as well. Uh, let me also thank you, uh, the initiators of this forum, for creating it. I think it's a great forum. And the ongoing digitalization of money and payments, of course, brings many possibilities, that's obvious, but it also brings many challenges. So I think having these kind of conversations is key to making progress in this area. So I'm forced to be uh, very selective and focused. I have only 15 minutes, uh, so you have to understand that, but we can broaden the discussion later on. and. What I have to say will be primarily on the role of the Riks Bank, and in particular what we're doing when it comes to our e-krona, the digital currency that we are working on. So just to, to introduce this, you know, the Riks Bank, of course, plays a key role for money and payments in Sweden. That's, I think, pretty obvious. So at the moment, we provide money that you can use for payments as physical cash, and we also provide the key infrastructure for, for digital payments. This is a settlement system we call RICS, which probably most of you are familiar with. Uh, and we ensure that the Swedish Krona keeps a stable value through our monetary policy. As you may know, we have an inflation target, but a predictable and transparent way of running monetary policy also contributes to the stability of the Krona in general terms. Uh, so, uh, it is, of course, our ambition uh, that what we provide in this field is up to date and that it lays the best possible ground for safe and efficient payments in Sweden. But being up to date, as you can imagine nowadays with these quick developments and trends that we see is not that easy. But I think we're stepping up in the central bank community, not only the Riksbank Bank, but other central banks as well. And this is needed, and, and I think we're making good progress at the moment. So I thought I would give you an overview of what we're current, currently doing at the Riks Bank and also some personal reflect, reflections on a few aspects of this. So switching then to my next slide. So I think when thinking about what is happening with money and payments in Sweden, an historical perspective is, is valuable. Uh, and I think you may look at this uh, in terms of three stages. So the first stage, which is actually not very long time ago, most payments were made with cash. And that was, of, of course, pretty natural uh, in a time when bookkeeping and exchange of information took a lot of effort, time, and was paper-based. And also at that time, uh, with cash, there's an immediate settlement as the recipient gets the money directly. So loosely uh, expressing this, you could say that the entire deal is undertaken as soon as you have paid, and then then it's sort of uh, it's it's done. Uh, back in the 50s, as you can see in this slide, uh, the total value of cash that uh, circulated in the Swedish economy was about 10% of GDP. That's a number quite similar to what we have today in the euro area. In the second stage of this, a new technology made it easier and faster to pay uh, with what we usually call commercial bank money. So basically uh, the deposit accounts that most of us, basically more or less all of us have at the commercial banks. And at the beginning, this involved checks and paper-based giro transfers. Uh, for some of the younger people in the audience today, that might be sort of exotic things but it's not so long ago that uh, those things existed and some of them, as a matter of fact, are still used today. And later on then, of course, we moved to electronic payments, uh, such as card payments, which are still, of course, very much used today. In the third phase, uh, phase uh, uh, more recently, the internet and digital technology have meant that bookkeeping and exchange information could occur instantly and in 
in principle required no work at all. So it is now possible to build systems whereby payments from a bank account to another bank account happens in a second or so and is initiated from a mobile phone, a smartwatch, or some other digital device that most of us have with us all the time. And here, of course, Swish, the payment app uh, that most Swedes have in their phones, is the, the prime example of this development stage. Uh, and the result of all of this is evident, I think, if you again look at the graph. So in the early 50s to basically today, cash as a percentage of GDP has fallen gradually and is now around 1% of GDP. So with this, we are probably the country in the world with the lowest use of cash. Norway is another country very close to Sweden that also has a very little amount of cash in circulation. But those two countries, I believe, are outstanding uh, uh, in this development. And it's pretty obvious from all of this that digital payments are here to stay. This is nothing that will disappear very quick. This is a, a development that is going on and we better take it seriously. So, but while cash has its roots in bygone times, as you, as you may want to put it, it still fulfills important functions. So one of the key functions here is that it uh, contributes to a uniform monetary system. And what do I mean by that? It is that each krona deposited in a Swedish bank can be exchanged one to one for a krona in the form of cash. And this also means then that a krona in one bank is worth just as much as a krona in another bank. This may seem a bit complicated, but it actually ensures that basically the exchange rate between all these kinds of monies is unity, which is a very important point in the financial system. Countries with different exchange rates usually don't do very well. So ensuring that you have a unit exchange rate between these different monies is very important. Also, cash, I think, is emblematic for the Swedish krona. It offers a safe alternative uh, to commercial bank money. And many, I think, of us, maybe a bit older people, but also I think many other people, consider this to be the very definition of Swedish money and the currency. It's very difficult to imagine a world where simply there aren't any coins and bills anymore there. Also, it can be used when there's no electricity or functioning digital infrastructure. And this may be important for certain parts of our country in particular, but also, of course, if we happen to run into a crisis or even a war, uh, then you know uh, this might be a very important uh, aspect. And finally, uh, cash makes it possible for those who, for various reasons, have difficulty in using digital solutions to make their payments. I think most of us here think of elderly people, but it's also true that there are other groups who have problems accessing or using advanced digital solutions. And it's important also to think about these people as we, uh, as we consider these de uh, developments. So if cash continues to decline as rapidly as it has done uh, recently, Sweden will in practice be a cashless society within a decade or two. So it's not really something, you know, 100 years away. It is just around the corner. And we would then lose the functions I was just talking about. And we would also, it would also mean that we were breaking a long tradition whereby the state or the Riksbank Bank has provided a means of payment for the general public to use. And that it is a means of payment for the general public is key here. I'm coming back to that uh, just in a second. Um, to deal with the decline in cash, the Riksbank is investigating whether it is possible and desirable to use a digital complement to cash. This is what we call the e-krona. And just like cash, the e-krona would be issued by the Riksbank and available to the general public. So this is what people call a retail uh, central bank currency, digital currency, as opposed to a wholesale that is only for financial institutions. That's an important an important point to make. So in that the e-krona would be digital, it would be better adapted to our digital society than physical cash, and it could be used in situations where it's not possible anymore uh, to use cash. And it could potentially ensure that we retain several of the functions of cash in a future when physical cash is no longer used. So for example, the function of ensuring that we have a uniform monetary system that I was just talking about, could be retained in that it would work 
with the existing payment system and be exchangeable one-to-one -one for cash and commercial bank money. Also, uh, the e-krona would, in the same way as cash, be a state alternative to commercial bank money, just as cash. Uh, depending on how it is designed, the e-krona could be used when there are disruptions to the electricity of supply and also disruptions to the digital infrastructure or bank payment systems. And we could also produce variations that make it easier to pay for those who have difficulty using the current digital solutions. And this, of course, taking care of externalities of that kind is easier for an institution that has no direct commercial interest as, for example, the Riksbank. And finally, it could also be a platform for further innovations and new payment services. So various functions that cash uh, has could be retained uh, with an e-krona. But I think there's also more fundamental aspects uh, that one needs to think about when it comes to the disappearance of cash. So, so one here is that an e-krona can be a safeguard against future threats to the Swedish krona. What I mean by this is that if you think about fintech companies with a large platform of users, I guess Facebook being the prime example, they may soon start offering payment services based on their own or a foreign currency. And if these services become common in Sweden, currency substitution may become a real risk. This uh, risk doesn't sound perhaps to you as very eminent at the moment, but you have to imagine that after all the decline of cash that we see in Sweden has nothing to do with, say, the Swedish currency being a less good product than, than the euro. It has to do with other aspects such, such as adaptation to new technology in society. Uh, and there, Sweden is a very quick mover. So this could actually happen also in a country like Sweden. And if we lose the Swedish krona, we also lose control of monetary policy and the Riksbank cannot anymore be the lender of last resort, as we call it. So this is the possibility of the Riksbank stepping in and providing currency when financial institutions run into problem. And this, of course, requires control of the currency in the country. And if you don't control that, then you have a problem fulfilling that function. And this would, of course, be a very problematic situation for us. Uh, and we, it would run counter to the decision that we made in the referendum in 2003, when a majority voted to keep the Swedish krona and not introduce the euro in Sweden. And I believe that a well-designed e-krona would contribute to ensuring that the Swedish krona will remain the unit of account in Sweden and also the currencies that we use for making payments in the country. Let me here also just quickly uh, add a few words on the relation between the e-krona and stable coins, which I'm sure you've heard about. So stable coins are cri cryptocurrencies that are backed by some other asset. For example, government securities or some other safer asset. One could, for instance, think of a Swedish stablecoin where the backing is in krona denominated assets. And proponents of this uh, stablecoins argue that they can be a platform for innovation and new services that they that can enhance the competition in the payment system. And while this may all be true that stable coins could fulfill that function, we also, I think, need to consider potential financial stability risk with stable coins. So one here uh, is that in a crisis situation, users want to get rid of their stable coins, and the issuer will have to sell the underlying assets in order to meet uh, that situation. And that can lead to a classic fire sale with associated price falls and further runs from the stable coin. And I believe that an e-krona appropriately designed could offer many of the services and possibilities that the stable coins are supposed to offer, but with a very important difference, namely that there's less risk since the backing is more solid and robust. And what I mean by this is basically that the e-krona is backed by the entire Swedish economy, including its stable institutions and stable economy and growth potential, which is something very different to backing in terms of financial assets. Uh, sometimes we hear that an e-krona would be fundamentally changing the payment market, and I don't really think that this needs to be the case. As a matter of fact, I would rather think that it's just the other way around. Not having any safe state money would be the big change. Uh, and as I see it, the e-krona would be a continuation of the system we are used to, 
where the Riksbank offers safe state money as a complement to private money. And up to now, this has been done with a technology that was effective when communication and bookkeeping took time. And with an e-Krona, it will be done with more modern technology adapted to the present day. And thus, an e-Krona uh, could be a way for us to ensure that the money that we offer is up to date and adapted to the digital realities of today. And it will ensure that the general public has continued access to state-issued money, just like we have had for almost 400 years. And let me just then finish off with uh, making the point that this is not just something that is going on in Sweden, which I think is important. Uh, so many uh, central banks around the world are working on digital central bank money, like the e-krona. And the technological shift entailed by digitalization affects all countries, although at various speeds. And one example of uh, an aspect that is affecting the speed here is just the amount of cash in circulation that I showed you in the beginning, where Norway and Sweden are countries that are more under pressure because of this development, but there are other aspects uh, such as competition with other players that come into play as well. So digital central bank money, usually called CBDC, is therefore investigate, investigated by most central banks around the world, including the ECB, the Bank of Japan, and the Federal Reserve in the US. And the Riksbank is deeply involved in the international cooperation and development of core principles and features for digital central bank currencies. Together with other central banks, we are also investigating if and how digital central bank money can enhance cross-border payments. I think this last point is a very important one. It's pretty clear that we're lagging behind when it comes to cross-border payments. They are too slow, they are too expensive, and th this is an area where we need to step up, and the Riks Bank is working on that, but I don't have time at the moment to go into details there. But just to finish off then, the Riks Bank has not yet made any decision of whether to issue or not an e-krona, uh, and if it will come, it will take some time. This is nothing that you sort of do overnight. Uh, it's a lot of testing involved, and you need to be very careful when you develop this. And there's also a big governmental payment inquiry running, uh, supposed to be completed by November 30, 2022, that will be dealing also with issues related to uh, the role of the government in the future payment markets, and this will matter for how we proceed in this area, I'm sure. So thank you very much for listening to me. I stop there.